So I want to say something exciting that happened, like literally for me, a few hours ago. Um, I was informed that in a nearby galaxy, uh, M101, which is only six and a half, six and a half megaparsecs away, um, the, this is called the Pinwheel Galaxy, a supernova was discovered on Friday night, uh, May 19th, a new supernova. And it's the closest supernova to us um, that we've observed in nearly 10 years. And um, so um, the people who discovered it, um, uh, well, some, there are many people following it, include Mike, including Michael and a uh, team in Arizona. There's a group at Santa Cruz that's following it. So the group in Santa Cruz asked us to take a spectrum of the supernova because it's changing every night. In fact, it's changing on the time scale of even five, six hours because the star explodes as it's expanding. Uh, the velocities of the material that it's pushing out uh, is changing, uh, certainly from night to night. And they're trying to, by measuring that every night, how fast the material is moving, you can understand the energetics of this exploding star. It's a very massive star that exploded, much more massive than our sun. It uh, first turned into a supergiant. It exploded, and the first detection of that explosion again took place on Friday, May 19th. So it's very exciting. We just took a spectrum right before we joined you. We took a spectrum, and we can share that with you. Um, in fact, I can share my screen and show you a little bit about what this, what we know about this supernova. So I'll take a moment to do that. Uh, in the meantime, uh, if the students have any questions about what what it's like to, you know, use a telescope or be an astronomer, please feel free to ask at any time. That, that's actually very amazing news. <laughs> yeah, it's very exciting. Very, very exciting. I'm going to show you a picture right now. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. So um, this is the galaxy, um, spiral galaxy Messier 101. And this is an image taken on May 20th, so on Saturday night. And you can see the arrow pointing to this bright dot. Do you see that? Um, supernova discovered, over, over, over discovered in your bite spiral galaxy. Now, um, there are some other links that I want to show. There was one in particular that um, showed what it, no, not this one, sorry. There was a beautiful um, set of images showing how I seem to have lost that site. I had it a moment earlier. There we go. Sky and Telescope had a very nice article about this. So there's the supernova. It has three letters after the year, I, X, F, that tells you something about how many supernovae have been discovered this year alone. Um, uh, this thing that's labeled 5461 is what's called an H2 region, region where new stars are forming. But this bright dot that my first is pointing, this did not write it. Or it, was very, it was very low brightness. And in fact, you can see a, a black and white image over here. But what is beautiful is this sequence of images. So you can see the dates here, 16th May. Uh, there was no supernova um, because the supernova location is right to the left of these two dots. You can see these two dots still. The supernova started getting brighter and brighter and brighter. This is today's the 22nd of May. This is the supernova right there. And you can see it was not even present on the 16th of May. It appeared on the 19th right there, this, this dot over here. Um, in this image, uh, it's blinking three images, 
one without the supernova, supernova with it getting brighter. The, the images are not perfectly lined up. That's why it looks like they're moving a little bit like that. And astronomers measure things in a funny unit called magnitudes. We won't go into that, but the supernova became that spot was first discovered on Friday night. Since then, it's become 40 times brighter. It's gone from 14.9 magnitude to 11 magnitude. So that's 40 times brighter. Okay, and we managed to get a spectrum of this thing. So very exciting. Anyway, and then you can buy shoes at the bottom of this website, but we won't do that. Um, yeah, to me, this, this sequence of images is very telling. Um, this spot that I'm pointing to is the same as this faint spot over here, this faint spot over here, uh, but the supernova is completely overwhelms it uh, in the course of a few nights. It's much brighter than that spot. Um, do students know what a supernova is? Yeah, they are saying they know what a supernova is. Oh, very good, very good. Okay. So, um, any of the elements in the periodic table, the iron, the steel, uh, the wooden boards on the, on, on the floor of the room, your pencils, your laptops, the material out of which these things are made, the metals out of which these things are made, were created inside. Um, stars while they were still living. And then even more elements are created when stars die during the explosion made it elements like gold and platinum are created during explosions. Um, anyway, so supernova are very important. Without supernovae, we wouldn't be made up of all these elements and chemistry would be a very simple subject with only hydrogen and helium to worry about and no other elements. So supernova are the reason chemistry is difficult. It's a complicated subject. Um, so this star that exploded is thought to have been 15 times the mass of the sun, 15 solar mass. It was a type of star called a red supergiant. And um, this was, um, um, yeah, this, this was something that um, um, exploded or the light from the explosion first reached us on um, Friday night. Now this object is six and a half megaparsecs away, which means it's 20 light years away. So even though the light from the explosion reached us on Friday night, the explosion took place in the star 20 million years ago. Light has taken 20 million years to travel from that star to us. So that's important to keep in mind. 20 million, six and a half megaparsecs. Does anything else to add to this? Should should we screen share? Uh, should also, I can stop my screen share if you. Oh, uh, you wanted me to show Kirsty's spectrum. Let me see if I can find that. Where is it? Exposure complete. Somewhere I had a I had the email from. I put it in the chat, Aja. You did. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'll go there. This is what a spectrum of a supernova looks like. Um, because the, 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 I guess the shock front is very, very hot. It puts out more short wavelength light than long wavelength light. So it has a very, it has a spectrum that tilts upwards to the left. Left is short wavelength, right is long wavelength. Um, this number here, 6500, corresponds to the wavelength of red light. This very broad peak here is produced by hydrogen, H alpha. This is hydrogen, 
hydrogen ions in which, oh, sorry, hydrogen atoms in which electrons are moving down from level three to level two, energy level three to energy level two. This broad line here um, that my cursor is on, uh, the, um, this is, corresponds to electrons moving from level four to level two. Hydrogen alpha, hydrogen beta. Again, this is hydrogen alpha at 6563 angstroms, which is in angstroms, uh, which is uh, a unit that's 10 times smaller than a nanometer. Uh, and this is uh, 4861 H beta. I don't know all the other lines here, but um, uh, I don't know what these, this absorption must be the A band. This must be the B band, 6850. These are, um, these dips are caused by absorption in the Earth's atmosphere, I believe. This spike over here, I believe, is nitrogen. Uh, sorry, alpha, sorry, two, uh, ionized sulfur. And that's about where I stop recognizing lines. What, are the, what is this doublet over here? Eric, Michael, Kaishan, Jerusalem, Jamaica, help. Looks like it's at 40. I'm not sure, but I think it's water or something like that. From it's what, sorry? I think. I mean, I, there's devlet that I know maybe related with telluric clients. So I think related oh, with. These telluric clients here, you mean? Mm, I think, I'm not sure. <laughs> yes, let me check. Um, one of these are. Uh, yeah, you these can are like you can select to show which, which kind of lines, like for example, show. Helium show hydrogen. Uh, use the to click the box on the right. And... The box on the right. Okay. Okay. Got you. Got you. That might be the carbon four line. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I you can maybe. see that's carbon four. Those lines are very good. It's a great suggestion. Those spikes yeah. are carbon four. Um, so one of those line to the left of this double, the line to the left is carbon four. I wonder if the other one is carbon three. No. Carbon three and carbon four are giving the same. No, not the same. So now carbon three and carbon four are shown. Uh, we can simply click on hydrogen and it shows you hydrogen alpha, oh, alpha, beta, gamma, delta. So this is level three to two, four to two, five to two, six to two. So the beautiful thing about this is we are seeing quantum mechanics in action, not in a laboratory, but in a exploding star, in an exploding star that's 20 million light years away. Um, let's see what other lines. I think there's some helium lines here, certainly. Yeah, these are helium lines. Okay, so this was not uh, sulfur too, this was helium. 6676, and I forget what this one's wavelength is 71 something. This one is 5876, sorry. This is 51, uh, 58, 5876 is a famous helium line. I was wondering, um, do we, maybe this is a very naive question, but um, do all the students understand English or just, is there some translation that's happening or that needs to happen? A good question. <laughs> yeah, good question, Eric. Yeah, yeah. Uh, most of the students can actually speak English. So. Great. It's fine. Oh, okay. Thanks. Uh, so, well, whenever they have a question, can they uh, intrude please. in the middle and ask? Yes, please. This is a great time to ask questions. So, can you guys hear me from the page? I'm having too much fun with this um, gadget here, with this widget. You can see that many of the species don't produce strong lines, but some do. Carbon-4 is a strong one. Do students know what carbon, you see C with four after it, do you know what that means? Come again? Uh, where it says C4 or C3, 
safe for carbon, do you know what means two, three, four? You guys know? No, I, I don't think so. Okay, so whenever you see the number two like that, helium two, carbon two, it means one electron has been removed from the atom. It means it's an ion. Whenever you see the number three, it means two electrons have been removed from the atom. When you see the number four, it means three electrons have been removed. So carbon four means a carbon atom. Normally a carbon atom has six neutrons, six protons, six electrons. But when you see carbon four like that, it means it's a carbon ion with six neutrons, six protons, but only three electrons. So you have to take this Roman number, subtract one from it, and that tells you how many electrons have been removed. So nitrogen five means it's a nitrogen atom from which instead of having seven electrons, four electrons have been removed because five minus one is four, four electrons have been removed. It's left with only three electrons. Similarly, yeah, sorry, go ahead, go ahead, please. No? Okay, some of them are saying they're getting it somehow, but some of them are not getting it here. Okay. So I, I guess, I can help uh, find out what it's trying to say. The yeah, numbers, the uh, Roman numerals behind the uh, name of the island shows how much electrons is being removed. Exactly. I think. Exactly. It's the number of electrons that you have to add one, and then you turn it into a Roman numeral. So if one electron has been removed, you put the number two after the element, because the number one is reserved for no electrons removed. So when you see O1 like this, it means a neutral oxygen atom. When you see O1 like this. Is it clear now? Yeah, great. Very good. This is an old way in which uh, chemists and spectral chemists, I guess, uh, defined, um, this is how they classified ions and atoms. They use Roman numerals. So one thing you can see is astronomy um, is a science that includes many ideas of physics, many ideas of chemistry, many ideas of mathematics. Um, it's really an object that combines these different things. It's not only about physics, it's not only about mathematics, not only about chemistry, it combines these three fields. This is true for many subjects, of course, not just for astro. Uh, astronomy, astrophysics, but um, now um, we took a spectrum of the supernova. We haven't um, processed the data to the point where we can make a graph like this yet, but soon uh, the team uh, that we will hand the spectrum over to will be able to make a spectrum, will be able to make a plot like this. This particular spectrum that you see here was taken only a few nights ago. It should say over here when it was taken. Um, it does say over here that it was taken on the 19th. You see it says OBS date means when it was observed. It tells you the name of the person who did the data analysis and so on. Um, It's all kinds of information here that I haven't completely and that I haven't looked at before. Well, I know someone, I recognize someone from Israel here, Avishai Galyam. He's at the Weizmann Institute. Um, he's someone I worked with for many years. He was actually Danny Moses' PhD student, Jerusalem. So Danny was one of the organizers of the conference we were at. Anyway, Maybe... Yeah. We can take a couple of questions, I think. Please, please, uh, please. Since, since the, uh, the, the voice the uh, voice kind of come through, I will go to the students. Okay. And then I'll, we will take three questions and then Perfect. you guys will answer it. Perfect. Okay. 
I can stop sharing my screen. You guys can hear me, right? Yes. All right, just as a, a warning, we will finish this target in less than about five minutes. Okay. And then we'll have to move on to the next one. That might be a good time to also to share the screen and show what we're doing. In fact, do you want to take over the screen Yo, check? Or or Eric? Oh, uh, sorry, sorry, go ahead. We seem to have Yo, lost them. Whenever you're ready to move, and I'll be there. Okay. We seem to have lost them, unfortunately. Is a connection oh, to not today? Back. It, was, it seemed okay. All right. Oh, here. Yeah, okay, they're connected. Sorry about that. Connection dropped for a second. No worries. Okay. First of all, thank you for giving me a chance. My name is Shubhan. My company is good. The first issue is the arms from the coming thing. Only see what you put there. How do you discover what you put there? The second is how far away you can not have it. So you got to go The third body is very easy. The third body is very easy. Do you guys get that question? I found it difficult to understand. I couldn't hear properly. Okay, take it slow and then ask the question. If any, if I am from RBC, only three percent of the earth, how did you discover or observe the full earth? The first question I think is how can we observe the full earth uh, if an astronaut can only uh, walk in like uh, a lower orbit uh, of some sort? Right. And the second so, question. How far away can NASA see, see through universe or galaxy? How far, uh, how far through the universe can we see? Uh, like how far uh, in terms of distance and also I think time. And the third okay. one, is there any supernova that is threatening the solar system? And his third question is, is there any supernova that is threatening uh, our existence? Thank you. Okay. Uh, Those are question great questions. Number two was, uh, I think I should collect all the questions and then we, we will answer it. That way is easier. Okay. I hope you guys are remembering the questions. I... Six. six questions. Oh, that's a lot. <laughs> okay. So you've got six questions. <laughs> all right. Okay. Let's answer the first three first, I think. Otherwise, we will forget. Okay. okay. Um, all right. And let's let's answer the the first uh, three, questions three questions and then okay. we move on. Yeah. So All I right. think I think the moon is far enough away that some of our best pictures of the Earth as a sphere are images taken from the surface of the moon. Um, that's far enough away. You know the I, yes. When you take pictures from the Hubble telescope of the Earth, that's in a low Earth orbit. It's difficult to take a good picture of the Earth. But when astronauts travel to the moon, you know, as they have in the past, as they are going to, going to do so or do again in the future, um, you get very nice pictures of the Earth as a, you know, distant globe. I took the easy question after three. I want to add the the um, the really cool fact, which is that you can observe, sort of observe the whole Earth from Earth. Um, if you want to take a spectrum of the full Earth, you can point a telescope at the dark part of the moon when the moon is a crescent because it is illuminated by what we call Earth shine. And so the nearly full Earth, the light from the Earth will bounce off the moon. And sometimes when you see a crescent moon, you can also see the dark part of it. It's a little bit illuminated. And that's because it's illuminated by the Earth. And so scientists have done this to see what an exoplanet, a planet in another, around another star, what its spectrum might look like if it had life like we did on Earth. Wow. It's two bounces of light, sunlight hitting the Earth, then hitting the moon, and then coming back to us here on yes. Earth. Yes. 
Yes. But in that process, it travels through the Earth's atmosphere before bouncing twice. Mm -hmm. once, once on its way in, once on its way out. Exposure. Oh. Okay, so we have to pause here so we can move to our next target. You have so a your question. So I'm going to go ahead uh, and salute. I have highlighted the, the next one. Kashyang, do you want to share your screen or do you want me to do that? I can do it. Share screen sharing is disabled, so I think only you can do it, Raja. Oh, okay. I can I, I can also enable screen sharing for oh. others. Let me do that. But we lost them. Hopefully they'll come back. It's so Rita, it is used to be seven six nine. I think you can get it. I see line fifteen highlighted. I'm slowing now. I've made Eric and Kaishan co-hosts. I can also share my screen so you can see what I'm looking at here. Um, but we um we we seem to have lost them. Though. We have lost them temporarily. Yeah. yeah. Is this it, another forty minutes or so? Uh, it will be you know, an hour. One hour. It's, a, it's a little bit thinner, so it'll be like around one hour, like 55 minutes. I think we totally got you The classroom reminds me so much of my own. We had to wear a uniform to school every day. We had to. Wear I had to uniform too. I went to an all school, so we had uniforms until 10th grade, 11th grade. Yeah. And we had we had two different uniforms, one for the summer. So it's all white in the summer. And then it was sort of black and gray in winter. And so their their uniforms really remind me of my winter uniform. They're back. They're back. I think we're back. You are back, okay. indeed. What you're seeing uh, yeah. on your screen. I, I was explaining the, the first uh, the first two answers that you guys gave them. Uh, the first one was that they can see. Uh, I mean, human beings have seen the full Earth from the moon, mm -hmm. and uh, I was also telling them about the moonshine, um, the Earth shine. Sorry, that we yeah. can see uh, the reflection of the Earth bounce back from the moon, and then we can do spectral analysis from that. So I was explaining that, and then the internet cut off. So you can, you guys can continue from that point. One of the questions you asked were, uh, was how far away can we see? Um, some of the most distant galaxies we've studied have been using the, the James Webb telescope and actually using nature's lenses. Nature has giant groups of galaxies that whose gravity can bend light. These are cosmic telescopes that we can line up the James Webb telescope with. And that's been used to study galaxies that are over 10 billion light years away, 10 billion. Uh, the, the, we think the Big Bang took place 13.7 billion years ago. So the furthest we can see with electromagnetic radiation is the afterglow from the Big Bang, something called the cosmic microwave background radiation. Before that, the universe was opaque and light couldn't travel freely through the universe. So there's this thing that's called the microwave background radiation. Yeah, sorry, sorry, go ahead. Do you, do you, well, what exposure time do you want to set while we're getting ready to... Uh... Uh, I think it'd be like 1100. Let me explain the answer uh, in, in the meantime. Okay. So... Uh, 1200, uh, 1200 uh, times uh, 3? Or 1100 uh, times 3? I think it's uh, be using shorter, like... Uh, okay. If you can change, I'll check again. Yeah, sorry. Mindeno. Okay. You want to do three exposures so, of that? Once we get... oh. Okay. Uh, usually, uh, there's dark matter and there's a galaxy of uh, But light So light travels in a straight line, right? Yes. Again, when it encounters like a galaxy or a massive object, it bends. Just like... Uh, how it would bend for a lens, right? Lens means no matter It bends light and it focuses it focuses it into a single point, right? So you, you can use the same kind of effect using what a gravitational lensing or a galaxy. In the galaxy, or smart spion galaxy, or shallow, na suno marik shallow, light un focus argo and both alay mam dat shallow malat. And then kaisutan esta marik shallow, we can observe rook al lobe. And then the first thing that we have seen is the cosmic microwave background. Which is 
Looks so great. Have you gone? Have you gone? Is it clear? Not sure if you guys are still on this Zoom as well, but we're lined up and good to go here. Wonderful. The exposures have started. Just started, like 30 seconds ago. Was that uh, the language that you were translating to, uh, Kirubal, was that Amharic? Yes, yes it was. Okay, fantastic. So I don't know if, the, if you can see on the screen, but this rectangle in which the number is counting down, this is the number of seconds left measure that we're taking now. Uh, it's nearly 20 minute exposure. 1100 seconds is um, something like um, lit almost 17 minutes. And um, what we're doing during that um, time is the shutter of the camera stays open and we are collecting light from this distant galaxy. This galaxy is further away than the supernova we took a spectrum of. This one is about 50 million light years away. Um, in megaparsecs, it's about 16, 16 and a half megaparsecs. It's part of a collection of galaxies called the Virgo cluster. It's in the direction of the Virgo constellation. So it's uh, visible in the spring sky. That's why we're taking spectra of it now in the spring, in the late spring. In the fall, it's not visible because in the fall, from our perspective, the Earth has moved up in its orbit. And the direction of Virgo is the same as the direction of the sun. So Virgo is up in the sky at the same time the sun is up in the sky. So the Virgo cluster can't be observed during the fall months, in the months of August, September, October, we can't observe it. But in the month of March, April, May, it's a great time to study the Virgo cluster. So this is something astronomers have to worry about. Where is object in the sky will determine the do nighttime observations of it. But what I've forgotten the first of the three questions. No, the first was, can we see the shape of the earth? One was, what is the most distant galaxies? What was, what was the third question? There was one more question. Yeah, it's about supernova. Uh, what traits uh, do supernovas hold? What? Okay, so that, uh, is there any supernova nearby that? Oh, near, nearby that's supernova, yes. Our solar system, yes. <laughs> yeah, nothing is threatening our solar system as far as we know. Um, We're but, uh, but there was we one move. that was discovered in 1987, before all the okay. children were born, 1987. So that is uh, 36 years ago. Um, and that was, in a nearby galaxy, not in our own galaxy, it was discovered in February of 1987. That was much closer than this supernova. Rubel's muted, but I assume he's doing the translation. Yeah, yeah, I'm kind of translating in between. Okay. Fantastic. If you can right. leave the audio on during the translation, please do, because we'll, we'll post this recording for the benefit of other children. Okay, okay, great. So uh, there was a, a kind of follow-up question uh, that was, how long does it take for a supernova explosion to happen? That, that was? About a month, about one Before month. No, oh, the process, about the process of a supernova explosion. Okay. Yeah, it, the explosion happens very quickly in a matter of seconds, but the uh, thing stays bright for about a month. Because... Uh, and also the entire process involved in a supernova explosion. You can ah. also explain that. Wow, that's a lot. Okay, let me see if I can do that. Um, uh, basically, when a star shines, it's a balance between it's trying to make it smaller because gravity pulls things in. 
and its nuclear fusion reactions trying to make it explode because nuclear fusion generates a lot of energy and that is pushing the material in the star outwards. So this, uh, when a star is shining normally, it's a balance between these two forces. The implosive force of gravity, implosion means inward, and the explosive force of nuclear fusion. These two things balance each other. But when a star starts using up its fuel, its nuclear fuel, uh, it can reach a stage where these two things can no longer be balanced. It runs out of nuclear fuel and it starts collapsing onto itself. When it starts collapsing, uh, there comes a time when the inner part of it becomes a neutron star or a black hole. So it, um, when it becomes a neutron star, the outer layers bounce because of the sudden uh, pressure exerted by neutrons on each other. And that bounce causes the outer layers of the star to explode. I'm going to try and look up a YouTube video of my colleague Stan Woosley demonstrating a supernova explosion. I'm going to see if I can put that link in the chat or in a subsequent email to you. Others, please take it away and explain a supernova explosion. That's the best I could do. Yeah, that's really good, Raja. Um, and so when we look at this explosion here, uh, this star that's getting right as it expands and gets bigger and bigger, and all this material comes off, it, it, it's just become such a uh, much more massive, um, such a brighter object that it's easier for us to see from the ground. And so one of the interesting things that we see with this one, when we're looking at it in terms of spectroscopy, is we're trying to see what the materials in these stars at the end of their life. Oops, so, sorry. So that we can trace the star before it explodes to figure out what causes the massive explosions at the end of the end of their life. <laughs> I have a little demo I can show you about an exploding star. It's called After School Universe. This is a very simple activity that models the supernova explosion that takes place at the end of a large star's life. The only supplies you will need are two balls of different sizes for each person that is participating. A tennis ball and a ping pong ball are perfect for this. If we drop just the tennis ball, it bounces a foot or two. If we drop just the ping pong ball in the same way, it again bounces, but not as high. When we drop them both together, with the ping pong ball stacked on top of the tennis ball, the ping pong ball goes flying off even further, and the tennis ball basically stays where it is. The reason this happens is that when the tennis ball hits the floor, its energy is transferred to the ping pong ball. In this model, the balls represent layers of the star's atmosphere that are falling inward during its implosion. These falling layers meet the energy from the iron core, represented by the floor in our activity, and rebound, shooting off into space in a dramatic supernova explosion. Okay, that's the best I could do at short. Uh, uh... Notice, I do this. I do this demo for my students in class. And like like they said in the video, you can easily do this. Take a tennis ball and a ping pong ball. You can do this. You can also do this with a basketball and a ping pong ball. So maybe uh, the video kind of broke off in the middle. Uh, if you can tell them the title once more, so that they can search for it when they get home. Just if they say bouncing ball. 
supernova demonstration. You guys got it? Bouncing Great. ball, supernova demonstration forwards. That's what I put in for the search. Okay. So I, I think that, can we continue off with the questions or you guys have? Uh... I'm fine if you want to continue with questions. This is, uh, yeah. Um, Eric, Kaishang, Michael, Rita, you guys okay with that? Yeah, I'm just wondering if you wanted to, if uh, I talked out for a sec, but did you explain what we're showing right here? No, please talk, please talk us through this. This would be good. So, um, so if, if you don't mind, we can show, since we're actually observing on the Keck telescope right now, um, it would be good to uh, just, what we're showing here is what we're actually doing, the work that's actually happening uh, on the mountain. Um, and uh, oh, we just switched. I can to... I can switch back. This is the okay. yeah. So what we're doing is we're taking um, spe taking spectra of uh, these ultra compact dwarfs, which uh, I think you may have seen some materials about that that Kaixiang put together. Um, and right now we have the shutter open. Um, the object that we are looking at is this object, uh, well, actually you can't see my- You tell me which one to point, oh yeah. It's this, the one on this, the slit. This object right here. That's right. That 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 is a compact galaxy, we think, um, in the nearby, well, somewhat nearby Virgo cluster, which is about 50 million light years away. Uh, and we are taking a spectrum through that slit there. And what we're seeing is, is an image of the, the night sky right around that uh, small galaxy. Um, and you can see these are the controls for the instrument that we're using. It's something called uh, ESI, the Echelet Spectra, Spectrograph Imager, I guess, is that? Yeah, right? I think I, I've heard it called the Echelet Spectrograph Imager, but yeah. I think it should be the Echelet. Yes, doctor. the ESI here. And you can see the time uh, ticking down in the green box. So we just passed 300 seconds, which means we have about five minutes left for this exposure. Uh, we keep the exposure open for a long time to gather uh, as much light as we can to take a long exposure. Um, and we're doing a series of three right now as we're speaking with you. The first one is uh, will be done in here in 200 and some seconds. Uh, and then we'll do two more, each of which is uh, 1,100 seconds. You can see total number of exposures is three, and it's on the first one of the three. Yes. Um, so when we're done taking the exposure, it reads out, and you want to, if you want to switch to the other screen. Yes, I will um, do that. The... Uh, and what you see here on the left is what a spectrum looks like. The light is dispersed sort of vertically. We are, we are... Huh? Yes, Kirbal? I don't know if you if you could if you I heard Kirbal us. say something, but I didn't understand. Mm -hmm. Um well, I hope you can still hear and see us. But um, what we're observing here on the left is the spectrum is this line that goes down the middle, this sort of bright line here. Uh, that is the actual object that's being the light, which is being spread out in from uh, blue to red, which is the blue is to the left here and the red is to the right here. And it goes uh, from bottom to top as well. Somehow my cursor disappears, Eric, every time I put it on the, hmm. the screen. Oh, yeah, I forgot. You can't see my... Uh, see, I can see my cursor when it's down here, but as soon as I move it up, it disappears. Can hmm. you see my cursor right now? Uh, I can see it until you move it onto the screen and then until yeah. you move it onto the spectrum for some reason. Yeah, so these, these lines that are curved run mostly vertically, as Eric was saying. This is a spectrum of a star and you sort of read this like a scroll you read uh it's wavelength increases from 
top to bottom. And then once you reach the bottom, you go to the next, uh, next column, read down, read down, read down again. And, you know, so this is, it's almost like reading the sentences in a book, except instead of reading from left to right, as you would in English, or right to left, as you would read in Hebrew, you read from top to bottom, and then you step to the right and read again from top to bottom. And wavelength is increasing as you get, um, as you move down along a row. The horizontal lines are produced by the Earth's atmosphere. The things that look like um, these short segments that are the horizontal lines, many of them, these, uh, you see many of them, they are produced by the glowing of the Earth's atmosphere, mostly oxygen that glows in the Earth's atmosphere. I can show some of the other screens. They are uh, caused by our atmosphere. Yeah, in the atmosphere, no, we create me a horizontal line. Hmm. Maybe shall I explain a little bit about this? Please then do. Can, because Please I already do. translate. Yeah, okay. Um, can you give me uh, permission for sharing? Of course, let me do that. Sorry about that. Let me take off my screen and I will make you a uh, co host. Just a moment. Sorry about that. Choose one. Where are you? Ah, oh, there you are. Okay. So, Jeru, start by saying hi and introducing yourself again, maybe, because we have uh, some late students that arrived after you guys introduced yourself. So, you can start from that. Okay. But now, now, now I'm going to talk in Amharic because I already translated in course, Amharic. Of course, please do, please do. Okay. Um, you should be able to share your screen now, Jeru. Okay. Hmm. Exposure complete. The first of the three exposures has finished. Are you yeah. seeing anything? We are seeing your Zoom screen. Um, yeah, okay. we are seeing to minimize the Zoom. And now? Yeah, yeah, we can see. Perfect. Okay, okay. So, and then not to summary, salam not to so any uh, yeah, PhD summary nine are Israel agar no memaro gun ahun dare na so observe miara gusto na describe mara galat chu gun any any PhD ni misara tala ek ek so plan ni chugara ita ganaya no. So Bachuru, and the Swahun observed me other good men the Hona, but Bach Bachuru, no, this kind of Maragulla too. So Yakala to take off to a lachu again, Bamar Niatin, the Maglas Ahino. So Ahun Uzermia Gosto, ultra compact dwarf galaxies. Sorry? Yeah, no, no, that was the automated sound from the, uh, from the, Instrument readout. Don't worry. Please go on. Okay. okay. So, ultra compact dwarf galaxies. We know, but I'm just going to tell you how to tin, but I'm, but tin is here. Me, but I'm thinking when I look at the Pluto, but I'm thinking planet, planet, not all that again. But I'm thinking why me, mass for that time or I'm, but I'm, I'm in the, in the no. And then you know, galaxy, okay, galaxy, you drink women, lacho, lacho, dwarf planet, lacho, and I'm at Antic in Lacho. So observe a hundred yard raguia look, cake observatory, me ball, a cermetery honor, till look, uh, twin, you know, Tamasasai, pull a telescope, look into observatory in Dallo, Tamasas, Elmsalin Toto, and the meter diameter, Tamasasai telescope in Dallo, Hidagmo, uh, USA, Mikan, um. Aster meter diameter low one uh mirror room let me know. So Kaza who no observe me other good. Now observe the other girls demo, eh honor cochun, nany dwarf in lacho galaxy to demo, dinky galaxy min the lacho no. So galaxy minimalet and the honor, you have to call us yes about low, 
ኪሩቤልም በኋላ ላይ ዲስክራይብ እንደማይረግላችሁ አቃለሁ ግን ባጭሩ ለመግለጽ ያህል ሶ ጋላክሲ ባጠቅላላ ይሆነ ትልቅዬ የጋዝ ኢንደስት እና ደሞ በቢሊዮን የሚቆጠሩ ኳክብቶችን እና ደሞ ፕላኔታሪ ሲስተሞችን በጠቅላላ በግራቪቴሽናል ወደ ማካኝነት ያዘ ትልቅዬ ሲስተም ነው ማለት ነው ሶ እን አሁን ስለኝ አሁን ያላቸው ለመመደብ ያህል ወይም ደሞ ጋላክሲዎች በጠቅላላ በሁለት መከፈል እንችላለን አንደኛው ደሞ በ ቅርጻቸው ላይ መቅርጻቸው ምን አይነት ሼፕ ነው ያላቸው በሚለው በሰረት አራት በዋናነት አራት በአራት መከፈል እንችላለን ኤሊፕቲካል ስፓይራል እና ባሪድ ስፓይራል እና ኢሬጉላር ይባላሉ ሶ ይሄ ቅርጻቸው ላይ ነው ስለምሳሌው ከዚህ ውስጥ የኛ ጋላክሲ ወይ ምክ የጋላክሲ ምንለው ባሪድ ስፓይራል ነው ሶ እዚህ ጋር እንደምታዩት ኤሊፕቲካል ምትላቸው ይለቅ ልክ ምን እንደሆነ ሞላላ አይነት እንደዛ አይነት ቅርጽ ያላቸው ናቸው ስፓይራል ደግሞ ታያቸው ልክ እንዲ ይሄ እንትን ያላቸው አርም ያላቸው ናቸው ባሪድ ስፓይራልም ተመሳሳይ ነው ከዚህ ጋር ግን እንትን አላቸው እዚህ ጋር እንደምታዩት ይሆነ ባር ሼፕ ነገር አላቸው እንደሱ ይባላሉ ኢሬጉላር ይባሉት ደግሞ ምንም ቅርጽ አልባ ናቸው ምንም ዲፋይንድ ይሆነ ቅርጽ የላቸው ማለት ነው ይሄ ኢን ጀነራል በቅርጻቸው ጋላክሲዎችን በዋናነት ለመከፋፈል ነው ሌሎችም ታይፖች አሉ ግን ባናነት ለማክፈል ነው ከዚህ ውጪ ደሞ አሁን እንዳልነው ድንቅ የጋላክሲዎች እንዳልነው ደሞ ሌሎች እነኛ አሁን ባለክ ወይ መደበኛ ምላቸው ወይ ትላልቅ ጋላክሲዎች ምንም አሉ ማለት ትላልቅ ትላልቅ ጋላክሲዎችና ድንቅ የጋላክሲዎች ብለን መከፋፈል እንችላለን ሶ ልዩነታቸው ምንድነው በውስጣቸው የሚዙት የኳክብት መጣ ነው ለምሳሌ ትላልቅ ወይ መደበኛ ምላቸው በ100 ቢሊዮን የሚቆጠሩ አማካይ ማለት ነው በ100 ቢሊዮን የሚቆጠሩ ኳክብቱን ሊዩዝ ይችላሉ ድንክዮች ግን ወይ በጥቂት ጥቂ በጣም ጥቂት የሆኑ ቢሊዮን ወይም ከዛም በታች የሆኑ ኳክብት ክምችት ነው ማለት ነው ሶ ልዩነት ማውና ልዩነታቸው ይሄ ነው ድንክ ያስባላቸው ማለት ነው ሌላኛው ደግሞ ድንክ ጋላክሲዎች ድንክ ጋላክሲ ምንላቸው በጠቅላላ በአራት መከፈል እንችላለን ለምሳሌ ብክ ቀደም ዋና መደበኛ ወይ ደግሞ ትራል ጋላክሲዎች አላቸው በቅርጻቸው እንደከፋፈል ነው ድንቅ ጋላክሲዎችም እንደዚሁ ሞላላ ወይም ኤሌክትሪካል ወይም ደግሞ ቅርጽ አልባ ቅርጽ የሌላቸው ይሄ ስፓይራልና አንብለን እንከፋፍላቸዋለን በተጨማሪ ደግሞ አልትራፌንት ምንላቸው አልትራፌንት ምንላቸው ዶርፍ ጋላክሲዎችና አሁን ደግሞ ዛሬ ምናየው ወይ ደግሞ አልትራፌንት ማለት በጣም ፈዛዛ ይሆኑ በቃ በስት ይታዩ ድንቅ ጋላክሲዎች ሆኖ ግን ደግሞ በጣም ፈዛዛ ናቸው እነሱ አሉ እነሱ የድንቅ ጋላክሲ አይነቶች ናቸው አሁንና ደግሞ አሁን ዛሬ ፎከስ ምናደርገበት እነዚህ የታመቁ ድንቅ ድንቅ ጋላክሲ እንመለላቸው አሉ ማለት ነው ሶ ትንሽ ለሰላነሱ ትንሽ አሁን የነሱ ካራክተር ለመግለጽ ይሄን ሶ ተይታመቁ ድንቅ ጋላክሲዎች ድንቅ ድንቅ ጋላክሲዎች ወይ ደግሞ ዩሲዲ እንመለላቸው ለምሳሌ ስፋታቸው ከ30 ወይ እስከ 300 ይብራሃን አመት ወይም ላይት ነው ነው የስፋት መጣናቸው እዚህ ጋር እንደምታዩት ለምሳሌ ሚልኪ ዌይ አለ በጣም ትልቅ ትልቅ ኦብቪስሊ ትልቅ ጋላክሲ ነው እዚህ ጋር ደግሞ የምታዩት ለምሳሌ የአንዱ የአልትራ ኮምፓክት አንድ ምሳሌ ነው ሶ እንደምታዩት በጣም ጋላክሲ ናቸው ሁለቱም ግን በጣም ኮምፓክት ናቸው በጣም እታን በጣም ሳይዛቸው በጣም አነስ ያለ ነው ማለት ነው እና ደግሞ በብዛት በብዛት የሚገኙባቸው የኳክብ ታይነቶች ያረጁ የቆዩ ናቸው ማለት ነው ለክ ዩኒቨርስ ይፈጣሪ የነበሩ ተብሎ የሚባሉ አይነት እንደዚህ አይነት ስታሮች ናቸው የሚይዙት በብዛት እና ደግሞ በትልቃታቸው ስቲል ኦፍ ኮርስ ከሚልኪ ዌይ ጋላክሲ ጋር ባናወራድሮ ግን ሚልኪ ዌይ ጋላክሲ ውስጥ ያለ ለምሳሌ ግሎብላል 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 ክላስተር መንላቸው አይነት ለምሳሌ ከነሱ ከሚልኪ ውስጥ ካለው ከሱ በጣም ይተልቃል ሶ የነሱ አፈጣጣር አክቹሊ ሶ ግራውን የነሱ አክቹሊ ምድ መፈጣጣር ሳይሆን ምድ ባቸው ራሱ ለምሳሌ ጋላክሲ መደቡ ወይስ የኮዝም ብሎ የኮአክብ ክምችት ወይ ለክ እንደ ግሎብላር ምናም ክላስተር እንደምንለው እንደዛ ብሎ እንክፈላቸው ብሎ ስቲል ዲቤቴብል ነው ማለት ነው ማለት አከራካሪ ነው ምንም ዲፋይንድ የሆነ በርግጠኝነት እንደዚህ ነው ማለት አልተቻለም እስካሁን ማለት ነው ምክንያቱም 
ጋላክሲ ናቸው የጋላክሲ አይነት ናቸው እንዳንል በጣም አነስተኛ ይሆናሉ ከዛ ደግሞ ከፍተኛ ምናሽ እንዳላቸው ያው ከጋላክሲዎች በጣም ያነሳሉ ግን ስካሁን በመቶዎች የሚቀጠሩ ድንክ ጋላክሲዎች ተገኝቷል ሶ አፈጣጣራቸው እንዴት ተፈጥሮ ሊሆን ይችላል የሚለውን ለምሳሌ ያሁን ስካው ያሉ መላምቶች ማለት ነው አንድ አንድ አንዶች ለምሳሌ በጣም ግዙፍ የኮከብ ስብስቦች ወይም ደግሞ ስቴላር ክላስተር ወይም ደግሞ የከነሱ የነሱ ናቸው ኦሬዲ በቃ እነሱ ጋላክሲ አይደለም ግን የስታር ክላስተር ናቸው ብሎ የሚሉ አሉ ወይ ደግሞ የተፈጠሩት ትላልቅ የስታር ክላስተሮች ሲዋሃዱ ወይ ምርጥ ሲያደርጉ የተፈጠሩ ናቸው ብሎ የሚሉ ማሉ ሌላኛው ደግሞ ዶርፍ ጋላክሲዎች ከተላልቅ ጋላክሲዎች ጋር በሚፈጥሩት መስተጋብሩ ወይ ደግሞ ታይዳል ዲስራፕሽን የተፈጠሩ ሊሆኑ ይችላሉ ተብሎ ይታሰባል ግን ዲፋይን ሆኖ በቃ እንደዚህ ናቸው ድንክ ጋላክሲ ምላቸው እንዲህ ናቸው ተብሎ በስትክል የታወቀ ነገር የለም ማለት ነው ስካሁን ሶ ዛሬ ምናየው እሱ ነው እነሱ ይሆናል ሶ ዛሬ ምናየው በቪርጎ ጋላክሲ ውስጥ ያሉ ቀደም እነሱ ሲሉ ሰምታችኋል ሶ እዛው ጋላክሲ እዛ የቪርጎ የጋላክሲዎች ስብስብ ነው ይሄ ደግሞ ጋላክሲዎች የጋላክሲ ስብስብ ማለት ደግሞ ልክ ከ ጋላክሲ ያነሰ ግን ደግሞ ስቲል ብዙ ጋላክሲዎችን በአንድ ቦታ ያዘ ማለት ነው ሶ ይሄ ቪርጎ ምንለው ለኛ ጋላክሲ ቅርቡ የሆነው የጋላክሲዎች ስብስብ ነው በማካይ ወደ 50 ሚሊየን የብርሃን የብርሃን አመት ከኛ የሚርቅ ነው ሶ እነሱ አሁን ኦብዘርቭ ያደረጉ ያሉ እዚ እዚ ፊልድ ውስጥ ነው ማለት ነው ወደ እዚ ፊልድ ውስጥ ያለ የ UCD ወይ ደሞ ድንክ ጋላክሲ ነው ማለት ነው የሚያዩት ሶ አሁን አክቹሊ ሶ ሻል አይ ጎ ዲስ ዲስ ፓርት አክቹሊ አይ ዲስ ፓርት this is uh, yeah so first of all from what i could i could understand the english is using thank you for going through this and it's fantastic fantastic um yeah if you want to talk about the point spread function and the um right the envelopes of the ucds that's what that those pages are about the last few pages right tasha and yeah jerusalem yes I'm thoroughly enjoying this. I'm not understanding most of what you're saying. But <laughs> I'm so happy you're doing this in in a different language because like it's a resource for other students. I and mean, those who couldn't join today, we'll post this recording for others. Okay. So I, I don't need to talk about this part. Right? You can because... if you want to. If you please do, please do. If you if you want to go through that, please do. Um I think it's too much too too, too more detail. detail too detail I feel yes like no, that's that's perfect Thank you Jimmy Cut this is great yeah Yeah the galaxies we are studying have sort of two components to them there's a central part that's very bright and then there's the outer part that is not so bright and more extended bigger but fainter and compact but bright in the in a part almost like with a nucleus in a cell the cytoplasm is distributed widely but then in the you have a concentration called a nucleus so these are uh, these galaxies are like that uh, the particular class of galaxies uh, these are uh, ultra compact galaxies but with halos with envelopes or halos I don't know if that is helpful at all. That's what those last pages were describing. Yes. But it also asked them to differentiate. Yes. Categorize, to classify something like that. But exactly. I think they need, they need to ha- to see it like on their hand otherwise it's yes. too far and mm, I don't know. I think it would be good if the students went off and looked at the PDF file, looked at the instructions and um if they come back to you or me with questions we can answer them over email. 
Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, no, this is terrific. I um, was I going to say? Um, Maybe I you should that, stop yeah. sharing also so that we don't have the uh, double Zoom thing. You know, you can. Sure, sure, Jerusalem. If you stop sharing, I can share my um, the what you may call it um, the control screen. Yeah. I'm happy to share the. Yes, I controls if that would be helpful. Is that what you had in mind, Eric? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. So it's on the second exposure, you can see two. And it's got about six minutes to go. Did the students have other questions that we can answer? Or Erica, is there anything you wanted to end with? Yeah, okay. Uh, if you have any questions, I think you had a couple of questions. All right. Okay. Uh, I'll pass it to the students to ask a couple of questions more. Please. Thank you. I can see if I can bring up people in the. I just ask to the. Yeah, minimize <laughs> the important questions. Okay. I hope I hope you can see her. Yes, we can see you. All right, say hello. <laughs> okay. So um, the first question is: When the supernova occurs, does it create new planets? Uh, so when uh, if you can if you guys can't hear it, when a supernova occurs, does it create new planets? Not immediately. And Not immediately. It creates materials. It creates. Uh, it it produces a very rapid shock wave, outward blast wave, that carries important elements in the periodic table. Very important so, elements. Immediately, I don't know if you can see the planet. If you can see the planet, you can see the material. Create the material. So, if you have the material, you can see the explosion of shock wave. It gets distributed throughout the, you know, the system. Or if it's... Uh, uh, throughout space, right? Know. No. If there's a cloud of gas and dust nearby, this shock wave can cause that cloud to collapse to form stars and planets. So yes, a supernova explosion can cause the formation, not just of planets, but of new stars and planets from the collapse of a cloud. Okay, second question. Um, the second one is this is sometimes planet... add one more thing just oh sorry sorry go ahead go ahead yeah second question <laughs> the second one is if the planets are created how are the necessities for people or other living things to be like how do you find the necessities to live in there yeah do they randomly occur or are there other processes so they occur in that area this is a great question and it is the question you asked is a project called Astrobiology, which is trying to understand biology beyond the Earth. And it's a new subject. People are just trying to understand. Um, um, the answer, the simple answer is we don't yet know the answer to your question. But people are trying yeah, very that. hard. So, so I think I too. Uh, life exists in the other, what are the you know, criteria or habitability, habitability in the area. So we don't really know because as far as we know, in your planet Earth is habitable. In the solar system, there is a habitable zone. But so far, it's called life detector. So all right. Um, how did all these things occur on Earth? The water, trees, and other things? So that's a, that's a great question. Again, I'll take a stab at it. Um, almost all the elements, not almost, all the elements you see here on Earth, none of them were produced inside the sun. None of them were. 
all the so have not come they did not come from the sun the sun is converting hydrogen to helium in its center but the helium it's producing is still locked inside the sun it hasn't escaped from the sun to come to the earth so all the elements that you see on the earth the hydrogen the oxygen to make up water the carbon dioxide carbon and oxygen to make up carbon dioxide nitrogen in the atmosphere all these elements already existed in the cloud of gas and dust from which the solar system formed not just the earth but the entire solar system the sun and all the planets oops yeah so we um, have very good reason to believe astronomers have very good reason to believe that the elements that make up life on earth came from stars other than the sun stars that lived and died exploded like supernovae before the sun and solar system were formed so in other words life on earth is made up of the ashes of dead stars but that death occurred before the formation of the solar system the solar system formed about four and a half billion years ago these stars died before that billion years ago six seven ten billion years ago and um, does that answer your question so yes on the again i'm just looking at you start the again a barrel merit action it's a rich but material merit lay a low half life exist in the other game as choose material generally and it's in your government no so all the materials in the universe besides hydrogen and helium are made from supernova explosions technically but a uh, explosion occur by me eject me other go manala gaza let's do i think it forms planetary nebulas if i'm if i'm correct right uh, not planetary <laughs> nebula necessarily not necessarily okay. only some oh, sure. stars from planetary oh, nebulae and i just also want to correct one other thing which is the first 20 or so elements 26 elements of the periodic table are actually produced during the lives of stars and okay. um, so not just during the death not just during supernova explosion death of a star um, other elements are produced during supernova explosions the heavier elements but uh, the lighter so elements carbon. At least up to carbon, uh, stars can produce up to carbon, I guess. Even up to iron, up to 26. Up, up to iron. iron. Okay. Up to iron, yeah. And the elements afterwards are formed by uh, supernova explosion. Heavier That's elements. one of the ways in which they're produced. They can also be produced in neutron star collisions and kilonovae. They can be produced during certain phases that's near the end stages of a star's life. Uh, there's a class of stars called AGB stars, asymptotic giant branch stars. They can also produce some of these elements that are beyond iron in the periodic table. Okay. DCD Clear. readout complete. You, okay. Um, those are great questions. You are destined to be uh, a famous astronomer one day. Mm -hmm. Maybe you already are. Uh, if, you, if, if you guys have the time for it, she, she got a couple of more questions. Please, please. Oh, but, oh, uh, this is great. Yeah, okay. You have a last exposure starting here, right, Kaishang and Eric? That's right, yeah. Okay. okay. Okay, the next one being, if there are planets getting created by the supernova, are they gonna be aligned or randomly occurring in the solar system? Yeah, okay. Please, please Do you guys get the question? Yeah, we heard the question. I don't know, Kaishang. Eric, Jerusalem, you want to take that away? Yeah, I can. So, the uh, planetary system of Sifataru, Lamsali, Buzu, Malet, Curio Chal, Lamsali, Munanet Melkromi, Fet of planetary system of Chungera. So, Kadam Dalachut, Gin, in general, planetary system of Chumifat, Katamasai, Katamasai, Element to Chno. Not a by Natiallo, more, the solar system, take up by Natiallo, yeah, theory. Yeah, um, accretion, yeah, accretion, no, yeah, accretion disk, no, yeah, Mindeno, Mahalla yellow, starry federal, the Mahalla yellow, Salahunazi, cloud of Nebulot, and the Fatta, and yeah, yeah, Mahalla Tilik Yehono, core accretion, Mudomo, self gravitating more, 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 more,
ሞር እንደዚህ ሰርኩለት ያደረገስ ሲ በአጠቃራው እንዲያሉትም እንዳለ ደስቱ ክላውዱ ያንዳንዱ ነገር አብሮ አክሬት ሲያደርክ ሱፕላንታሪ ሲስተሞች በዛው ይፈጠራሉ ሶ ከተመሰ ሞስት ፕሮባብሊ ሁሉም አብዛኞቹ የሚሰሩት የሶላር ሲስተም ክፍሎች ከተመሳሳይ ኤለመንት ነው የሚሆነው ማለት ነው የሚፈጠሩትም አንደኛው ታብሎ ማለት ሞር ተቀባይነት ያለው ቲዮሪ ይሄ ነው ሶ ከተመሳሳይ ነገር እንዴ መሃል ላይ ያለው ሞር ማሲቭ የሆነው ስታር ይሆናል ሌሎቹ ደግሞ አብሮ አክሬት የሚያደርጉት ፕላኔት ይሆናሉ ማለት ነው ሶ ተቀባይነት ግልጽ ነው ኦኬ yeah i have four more questions the first one being um our galaxy is the milky way so if we leave the milky way do we find other galaxies or is it going to be black, like the black hole where we find nothing else huh? yeah this can you record that i understood the first part of the question that said we live in a galaxy called the milky way but i didn't couldn't understand the second part of the question uh if we leave our galaxy the milky way galaxy uh do we get do we find something or do we just go into a void ah no um that's a very good question there are many other galaxies like the milky way around us in fact there are some galaxies that are bigger than us andromeda is slightly bigger than us um there are many gal- there are even more galaxies that are smaller than us we are not alone in the sense of the milky way um it's we are one of many galaxies but this is a very good question because uh, about 100 years ago people didn't know the answer to this question there was a very important debate some people believed that the milky way was unique of its own kind and these other things that um look like fuzzy blobs like the one we are studying today they believe that those were inside the milky way this was believed by famous uh, astronomer named harlow shapley uh his opponent in this debate uh, um curtis believed that these other things were galaxies like the milky way just far away and it turns out curtis was correct Shapley was incorrect in this uh, basic debate now in the end it turns out there was some element of truth for both of them our galaxy is so big uh, in fact eric and one of our other students uh, you think we recently found stars that are so far away in the milky way that we know that our galaxy is so so big that there are actually smaller galaxies that are inside it that are orbiting inside it um so there are some small galaxies that are inside the milky way but um there are many more galaxies outside the milky way that are like the milky way does that you answer your you question that there are a couple of small galaxies but if you go further there are even bigger galaxies so you will not walk into a void no yes, right. you won't go into a void there are voids okay. there are empty regions of space but there are also regions that have many many galaxies okay one last question <laughs> sure these are great questions okay one last question just all right the last question being if we plan on making a traveling system from earth to any planet directly can we find a way to like transport ourselves from earth to a galaxy to a planet directly with one like um without using a rocket or without being an astronaut for vacations like we go to other countries in the future like on what if random we need to travel like can we create a portal to oh what kind of portal and then yeah. for example if this is earth we got a route and it's got a we're going to be connection I mean the the physically when a material you want to put do we need that cuz if it's going to be with the rockets and stuff it's going to take a long time yeah yeah true it's going to be easier cuz it's going to be with yeah but the ma- the material itself is kind of going to yeah. be heavy so, yeah. um, ah so 
I don't know if you guys get her question, but she was asking if we can build like um, a solar, a highway in our, in our solar system, is it possible to have like a physical highway that we can build that can connect planets without having to use rockets? Right, I don't think so because the distance between us and these other planets are constantly changing. We're orbiting at different speeds. Um, let's say the distance between us as, and Mars is constantly changing. So it would be, if we built something connecting us, it would have to be something that can stretch and contract in length. Um, people are planning to send um, spacecraft rockets to Mars. It would be about a one and a half year journey each way. Um, my wife actually works for NASA and they think that they, they do research on what the effects of long-term space flight is on living systems, on humans and other living systems. So um, this is something, but it comes back to the method of rockets, not, not uh, building a highway or a bridge. Yeah, this kind of reminds me uh, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. <laughs> true yeah true. very famous book all right so i think we can proceed with your uh, talks and then we can interlude uh, other questions if the students have i'm going to hand it over to eric and kaishang to see if they want to add anything um, um. I uh, don't have anything specific to add. I think, uh, you know, it's um, great that that Jerusalem that you were able to uh, you know, provide a translation for the introduction to the science that we're doing uh, and um, based on Kaishan's materials. Uh, I think one thing that we maybe didn't describe is what we're actually trying to observe. Um, we're observing these UCDs, but when we get the spectrum, what we're trying to do is we're trying to measure how fast the stars are moving inside these galaxies. Um, and when you can measure how fast the stars are moving, you get an idea of how much mass there is there because the stars have to move more quickly to overcome the gravitational pull of the, the mass in the galaxy. And so one of the goals of this project is to measure um, the mass based on the velocities of the stars that we're that we're that are in these galaxies. And uh, the reason we're interested in doing that is because we think these galaxies may have black holes, massive black holes at the center. And so if they, do, then the stars may be moving faster than we might expect, given how much light there is coming from the galaxy. So it's a way of checking uh, sort of two ways of measuring mass. One way is to measure how bright it is and then translate the light into a mass. But another way is to measure how fast the stars are moving and then to gravitationally measure the mass. And if there's a dark mass in there, like a, a massive black hole, then the stars will be moving more quickly than we expect. So that's the, the main goal of this project. Um, and we are looking at these special uh, UCDs these, that have envelopes around them that Kaixiang has discovered. Kaixiang, is your paper on the archive yet? Um, not yet. Not yet. Okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Maybe it's it's also good to share <clears throat> share a screen for for example the all sky camera right now on like Subaru to we can show like. Are you able to do that, or shall I um, go to I, that? Yeah, I don't think right now I can now share. Yeah. I made you co-host though. You should be. But oh, but I, I just like drop it. 
before suddenly so maybe i'll am i i, I am sharing now right because i can't seem to stop my screen share oh there we did i just stopped my screen share okay would you like to share your screen Kaishan? i can easily make you co-host <clears throat> yeah maybe yeah do that Um, Jerusalem, the um, the writing, the Amharic writing is so beautiful. It's so decorative. Thank yeah. you. Wow, this is a beautiful odd sky image. Yeah, you can so, see the Milky Way. It's so beautiful. Yeah, so there are two actually two two things that happen. One thing is to the west that today is the conjunction for the moons and the the, the like the new moons with the Venus. So you can see oh. there's a, a two like, like starlight, but you cannot see it clearly, but smaller things is, um, is the Venus and the bright one, which is both the prominence is the, the, the moon. Is this and, the moon? Uh, can and, you point your cursor to the moon? Can you see this? Yeah. Oh, that's the moon, wow. This is the moon and this is the Venus. Like behind, smaller behind this. Oh, so, wow. so today, if you if you have time and the, the weather is clear during the evening, you may be able to see like the moon with with, with Venus. So their conjunction, like they're close to each other, will happen like uh, once in a month because the moon just moves around the sky like one month for a, a circle. So we will just meet each other. And then you can see that towards the east, that's the the Milky Way, the like the core, the brightest part, which is towards the center of the union, uh, is toward our Milky Way. Is right now they're rising, just a, like above the horizon. Yeah. So these are two things that happen. So I want to ask the students a, a question, a small test. Think of you have to draw a picture when you go home. Uh, moon, Venus, Sun. When the moon is close to Venus from our perspective, can it ever be a full moon? Or does it always have to be a crescent moon? When the moon looks like it's close to Venus in the sky, can it ever be a um, full moon? Or does it always have to be a crescent moon? a difficult question but you have to draw and you will if you draw you'll find the answer to the question so uh which one of the, this is a Kaishan is showing a, a an all sky camera from the summit of Mauna Kea which is where we're observing and I don't know if we can see which one of these telescopes is is the is Keck 2 I, I think it's the upper one the upper one. The one further away from 